Hello everyone, I'm Tings from the Dongsheng Collective, and this is News on China. Let's get to the top stories we've chosen for you this week. President Xi Jinping called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and reiterated support for the creation of a Palestinian state as part of the two-state solution. On Tuesday, BRICS countries held an extraordinary virtual summit to address the crisis in Palestine. It was during this meeting that she stated, and I quote, the root cause of the Palestinian-Israeli situation is the fact that the right of the Palestinian people to statehood, the right to existence, and the right of return have been long ignored. Earlier this week, a delegation of Arab and Muslim foreign ministers led by Saudi Arabia visited Beijing as part of a tour to promote an end to hostilities and allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. The group included officials from Jordan, Egypt, Indonesia, Palestine, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They met with China's top diplomat, Wang Yi. This pressure from the Global South, including mediation by Qatar, seems to have yielded results, as on Tuesday, Israel and Hamas agreed to a four-day ceasefire with the exchange of 50 Israeli hostages and 150 Palestinians. However, earlier in the day, the EU parliament had voted against the ceasefire. So far, China has provided approximately $2 million in humanitarian assistance through the Palestinian National Authority and UN agencies, as well as an additional $2 million in food and medicine for Gaza, with the assistance of Egypt. In his BRICS speech, she said that China will provide more supplies and assistance to Gaza. China has launched anti-corruption probes into 41 senior officials since January of this year, matching the record set in 2014. According to China's top anti-corruption body, the 41 senior officials include those with positions at the ministerial level and in state-owned enterprises, as well as 17 who are retired. Seeing a culture of bribery and graft as a threat to the CPC's credibility, combating the flies and the tigers of corruption has been a priority of President Xi Jinping and his signature campaign since he took office in 2012. Four million regional level officials and 533 officials at the vice ministerial level and above have been investigated since this campaign was launched. First signaled in 2020, the focus on retired officials was indicated when she ordered the launch of a retrospective corruption campaign going back two decades in Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region's coal sector. The campaign cracked down on 1,163 officials, up to the level of the former vice chairman of the region of Bai Xiangchun. Among the high-profile anti-corruption cases against retired officials this year was He Zhuhua, former vice director at the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration, who was prosecuted nearly nine years after his retirement. Officials and state-owned companies have been under particular scrutiny this year. Former Bank of China chairman Liu Liangge was arrested in October on charges of bribery. And in this past week, Zhou Qingyu, the former vice president of China Development Bank, the nation's largest policy lender responsible for funding large-scale development projects, such as in the Belt and Road Initiative, was expelled from the Communist Party for serious violations of law and party discipline, include, and I quote, rampant abuse of supervisory and disciplinary powers. These developments reflect the seriousness of Xi Jinping's 2012 statement, where he said, and I quote, No matter who they are, no matter how high the position, as long as they violate party discipline and state law, they will be seriously investigated and severely punished. It's never an empty promise, end quote. Remember the two Canadian Michaels who were detained in China for nearly three years, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, which we discussed here on News on China. Throughout the years, the Canadian government has consistently denied espionage allegations, even used this fact to smear and demonize China. Well, more than two years after the return to Canada, Spavor has now told the Canadian media outlet that he did in fact share secret information about North Korea with Kovrig. However, he claims that he didn't know that his colleague would share it with Canada and the Five Eyes Intelligence Network that Canada participates in, along with the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand. Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig were detained in China for nearly three years, which Canada alleged was arbitrary detention and retaliation for the arrest of Meng Wanzhou, a senior executive of Huawei, who was arrested in the country at the order of the United States and was kept in house arrest for three years. Both Meng and the two Michaels were released in an agreement and allowed to return to the respective countries. Spavor says he was detained because of Kovrig and is now seeking millions of dollars in compensation from the Canadian government. 
The two Michaels were hailed as heroes upon the return, but neither had provided details about their detention in China. With these new statements, the Trudeau government's denial of espionage has been called into question. So here's one more story about Huawei. Not too many weeks ago, the Chinese company surprised the world with its new cell phone, the Mate 60 Pro, that contains a 7 nanometer chip. Well, just recently, the Japanese newspaper Nikkei Asia, along with a research company, disassembled the Mate 60 Pro and found that 47% of the value of its components were manufactured in China. As a comparison, its previous version only had 29%. The value of its components manufactured in China reached $198, almost double compared to the Mate 40 Pro from 30 years ago. The proportion of Japanese components dropped from 19% to only 1%, while South Korean parts increased by 5 points to 36%. You can say that these developments are a direct consequence of the sanctions imposed by the U.S. and other Western countries, which has in turn pushed China to accelerate the pace of developing domestic technologies and to strengthen digital sovereignty. For instance, it was estimated that China would take about seven years to manufacture the 7 nanometer chip domestically, but this feat was achieved in just five years. So what's going to be the next Chinese development? We'll be following closely here at Dongshan. That's it for us this week. Thanks for watching our video. Please like, share, and leave us your comments. For more, you can find the links to all the sources we use in this video in the description below. Follow us on social media at Dongsheng News. And if you want to receive our newsletter every week in your inbox, you can subscribe at dongshengnews.org. I'll see you next week. 再见!